Before comedy was my profession, I used humor every day. I used it as a shield, I used it as currency, as a soothing mechanism, I even used it as a weapon. In 1988, I was in the middle of a very contentious divorce, the kind where I needed a court order of protection. So I should have known better when I buzzed him in from the lobby. He said that he needed our daughter's leotard for gymnastics, and that seemed plausible. I hung the leotard on the outside doorknob to avoid any contact, but he must have flown up the three flights because he got there just as I was closing the door, and he overpowered me. Our apartment had a long hallway with one light fixture, a sconce. Had to be adrenaline, but he knocked it out of the wall like it was nothing. He knocked it so hard that he ripped part of the wood stud it was attached to. It broke off as one long, jagged piece. It looked like a dagger. He came at me like a shot, one hand around my throat, the other holding the sconce. He had me pinned to the floor, and I'm looking up at this jagged piece of wood, and time slowed down. He was yelling things like, you think you could just change the locks? You think I was going to let you? And I can't really hear him because all I can focus on is this dagger cutting open my face. His words actually started to sound like the Charlie Brown grown-ups, you know, wah, 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 wah. And that must have triggered something because all of a sudden I could see it from a different perspective. Like I was watching a movie, an absurd movie. I mean, here was this guy, this pseudo-intellectual, three months shy of his PhD at Columbia. Who had more to lose here, him or me? Sure, I could lose an eye, but permanently disfiguring your wife's face probably doesn't look good on a resume. And that made me smile, and then it made me laugh out loud. He's looking at me like, what could you possibly find funny right now? And I said, go ahead. Go ahead, cut up my face. Everyone's going to see it. You're going to be the guy who cut up his ex-wife's face. And after that, well, you know, good luck getting laid. <laughs> and that was the joke that saved my life. I never said it was the greatest joke of all time. <laughs> But, you know, it worked. He put down the sconce, and he never touched me again. I felt so empowered. I mean, if a joke could beat that, I could do anything. Understand, I met him when I was 19, and we were talking about a very charming, smart, witty man. I thought he was brilliant, and he was. But then again, so was Stalin. <laughs> I married Stalin. Took me a while to figure out I was Poland. And to be clear, there was no physical violence in my marriage until the very end. Before that, it was just words, every day, cruel, harsh, mean words, words that could cut you. It took a literal piece of wood hovering over my face to discover I had a superpower. I could see the funny where others couldn't. If I shifted my perspective, I could root out the oddity, the absurdity, and then I wasn't trapped anymore. Jacqueline Garrick published a paper called The Humor of Trauma Survivors. She said, humor does not minimize the significance of a terrible event, but it does allow the survivor to see how they can cope and thrive in their environment. The chaos that I lived every day in my marriage was all about surviving. I had made a deal with myself that I would endure every insult, every betrayal, as long as he didn't raise a hand. It wasn't a good deal. By the way, if you're looking at your spouse thinking, will you just hit me already? Your life is not exactly a rom-com. <laughs> but you know, when I had those thoughts, thoughts that could make me laugh about myself, I did feel like I could cope. But thriving? It wasn't until I had a strategy to tackle my paralyzing fear that I began to see I had options. And when I saw 
I had options. That's when I made better choices. There's a very famous Harvard study that shows exactly what happens in the brain when we hear a joke. All these neurotransmitters spring into action to process the incongruity, which is what a joke is. And that makes sense, because when we're trapped in a mindset like blinding rage or paralyzing fear, a joke is the one thing that can jolt you out of that, that pattern. And when that happens, it can be a golden opportunity. I'll give you an example. I was sitting with my friend who was going through a nasty child support dispute and they were exchanging these rapid fire, vicious barbs via text back and forth. And I was sitting with her on the playground while our kids played watching this unfold. And she shows me his last text. He wrote, Diane, what will you do when you have no one's life to destroy? And I grabbed the phone and I typed one word, kickboxing. <laughs> Radio silence. Five minutes later, he wrote back, ha ha, I can get you some money by Friday. Now, that wasn't the perfect outcome, but it was progress, and she was able to pay her kids orthodontist. That snappy comeback was enough to interrupt the cycle. And you don't have to be a comedian to use this technique. Everyone has access to this. And any incongruity there would have worked. What will you do when you have no one's life to destroy? Hot yoga. Colonics, <laughs> rearrange my sock drawer. Every, the, any incongruity would have been sufficient to shock it, to be silly, interrupt the, the, the loop that they were stuck in. So next time you feel trapped in your circumstances, go back, take a second look, see if there's something funny there. I mean, unless you like feeling trapped. I know I don't. Some of you are too young to remember a world before Easy Pass. <laughs> but there was a time when we had to actually stop for tolls. And in New Jersey, you had to stop like every 15 minutes. You had two options. You had the full service where you waited in line and got change, or the self-service where you threw coins into a basket. When I first started out as a comedian, I used to work for this comedy booker who was based in New Jersey. He was kind of a sleazy guy. Uh, he managed a strip club during the day, and at night he booked these comedy shows and sports bars and Knights of Columbus halls. They paid like 100 bucks, but for a new comic to be able to perform in front of a real audience and actually make a few dollars, it was huge. The only catch to this gig was that I would have to drive the booker home afterwards. And he always came with a pocket full of change. So every time we hit a toll, he insisted on throwing the coins in the basket. And that meant that his arm was gonna go across my chest, purposely skim over my breasts, essentially trapping me in my seat for the whole transaction. It was so gross. I was afraid to say anything because I wanted the work. One night, I thought I would beat him at his own game, and I brought my own change. That didn't go over very well. He was very offended. He said, why do you have to be like that? You know I just want to see them. What? Just show me your breasts. He didn't say breasts. And right away, I went for the jokes. Why? They're not that great. <laughs> you work in a strip club. What do you need my boobs for? And I'm looking around, and it's very late at night. There are not a lot of cars on the road, and I'm starting to get a little nervous because it is taking a dark turn. What do you think? You're too good for me. What do you think? You're so hot. What do you think? You're a princess. Ah, princess. I can work with that. And he, he keeps droning on. Why can't I see your breasts? Why won't you show me your boobs? And I just screamed, and I said, because I am Jewish. And he was shocked by this and, like you, a little confused. And yes, I am Jewish, but I'm not that Jewish. I said, I'm not even supposed to be alone in a car with you. And I think he, he was scared and he didn't say anything for the rest of the ride. After I dropped him off, I realized that it was a Friday night. It was the Sabbath. 
So either he was an idiot or I was very lucky. You know, for some people, that would have been enough to quit comedy or slow down, back off, lose momentum in their careers. But after what I'd been through, I mean, I really have to give Stalin credit. He's one of the reasons that I can be a stand-up comedian. You may not know this, but the comedy world is not exactly a warm, welcoming, safe space. <laughs> In fact, it is the ultimate abusive relationship. Yes, you have to be funny, but if I didn't have my superpower, I would never be able to handle the beatings that I have taken in show business. Chances are none of you will ever be attacked by someone wielding a jagged piece of wood, and I hope you never get in the car with the toll booth molester. <laughs> but I'm guessing in your life, someone or something has intimidated you. Next time that happens, look beyond your circumstances. See if you can root out the irony, the oddity, the incongruity. Grab onto that until your fears subside. Never underestimate the power of seeing the humor in any situation. Humor saved my life more than once. It could save yours too. When humor is your safety net, you might as well leap. Thank you.